Hello everybody and thank you for joining me today for, for the session on wound infection. I'm Jen Letchford and I'm Tissue Viability Nurse Advisor with Coloplast. I'm hoping that you'll find today's session really useful um, and you'll go away with some, some further information around wound infection and how that can help in your day-to-day -day practice. Today's session has been endorsed by the Tissue Viability Society and is purely educational. The content that we'll be covering today is wound infection continuum, looking at biofilms and the, infe the effect that they have on wound healing, wound infection and the types of bacteria that can cause infection, diagnosis of wound infection and how we manage wound infection once, once it's there. So some of the learning objectives and the things that you should be able to do after today is explain the risk factors associated with the development of wound infection, outline concepts of biofilms, what they are and how we can best treat them, identify differences between uh, stage, stages of wound infection, describe the process of, of managing infected wounds, and we're also going to be look at the, looking at the holistic assessment um, and care planning when it comes to wound infection. So we'll start um, with wound infection continuum. Um, just a bit of background here, the clinical relevance of wound infection. So it's quite common to have um, a wound infection but it, it can cause a real complication and um, prevent and delay wound healing. It can have an adverse effect on a patient's quality of life um, and really treatment costs as well then rise quite significantly if we're trying to, to manage a wound infection. It's demanding on our resources and we all know that resources that we have are limited anyway. So this can have a huge impact on our practice. So what we need to do is a thorough holistic assessment, um, early intervention and prevention where possible, and try and manage any um, patient outcomes um, to, to improve those patient outcomes. So wound characteristics, um, what predisposes somebody to infection? Well, if we look at acute wounds, it can be the type of surgery that somebody's undergone, for example. Was this a dirty surgery, a bowel surgery maybe? So, I mean, they might be at higher risk of developing infection because of that. Or we could be looking at the chronic wounds and how long the wound has been there, the size and depth of the wound, or where it's placed on the body. You know, it's anatomical location. Um, for example, if it were around the this, this sacral area, then it might be higher risk than, than a wound maybe on an arm, for example. There are some characteristics which cross over on both acute and chronic wounds, and that can be uh, things such as hematoma or increased exudate um, or sloughy necrotic tissue sitting in a wound bed. Again, can, can really predispose somebody to an increased risk of wound infection. So who is at risk of wound infection? Well, there are a multitude of factors that we need to take into account. And we can really separate these into the individual risk factors and the environmental risk factors. Um, so we'll, we'll start by looking at some of those individual factors. That can be things such as previous surgeries, medications that somebody is taking, what their tissue perfusion is like, whether they have any associated um, underlying impairments, um, immune system disorders, if they're taking cytotoxic drugs, for example, because of a, a cancer diagnosis, do they drink alcohol, smoke um, or abuse drugs? Then we look at some of the environmental factors. And they can be things like um, hospitalisation, is somebody in an environment that they're not their their body is not used to? Is it an unhygienic environment? What's their hygiene like? And and are we undertaking aseptic technique when, when we're changing a wound dressing? Is there a repeated trauma of the same area? Um, with, that can either be from somebody scratching, maybe, or from somebody um, that has an inappropriate dressing 
on and the, the constant removal of a, an in, inappropriate dressing. So all of these things um, can really increase risk of wound infection. And these things can be relevant to anybody. So really anybody with a wound is at risk of infection. So wound infection, we, we need here to look at the microorganisms within a contaminated wound. And actually infection becomes a problem when the microorganisms move deeper into the wound tissues and they proliferate and can cause local or systemic immune response. And we'll come on to this in a little more detail later on in this presentation. So stages of wound infection and looking at our wound infection continuum, you can see that, there, that this runs from contamination right the way through to system, systemic infection. And we're going to look at each of these um, columns individually. So contamination. The wounds considered to be contaminated when there are non-proliferating microorganisms present. So this would be a normal wound. It would be showing signs of healing, um, but there will be microorganisms within the wound bed. But they're not causing any problem with the host's response um, to treating those. We then move on to colonisation. And the microorganisms within the wound bed here are undergoing limited proliferation. But again, they're still not causing a, a host response. So they're not causing a problem to this wound. They're not delaying the healing. Um, and it's not at a critical level where it's likely to damage the tissues within the wound bed. We then move on to local infection. And this is where we're starting to see some changes and, and where we're, we're also starting to need to think about um, ways in which we can treat the bacteria. So the microorganisms here proliferate and they're moving deeper into those, those tissues of the wound bed um, and they're starting to cause a host response. So this is where we might see some localised um, infection signs such as um, erythema or maybe increased exudate. Um, but the microorganisms in the wound bed are starting at this point to really multiply. And this is where we need to try and get on top of it to stop it from um, deteriorating further. If we don't manage to get on top of it, then it will lead to that spreading or systemic infection. But the local infection signs and symptoms, which we may or may not be familiar with, are sometimes hypergranulation or overgranulation, as it's otherwise known, some bleeding, uh, breakdown in the wound tissue, so the wound starts to all of a sudden get bigger, wetter. Um, we're noticing that delay in healing. Patient may be experiencing some, some pain um, or they may have noticed an odour at this point. Some of the really classic symptoms would be heat, swelling, um, purulent discharge and pain for the patient. So if that's not managed, that's likely to lead on to our spreading infection. And this is when the microorganisms that are present within the wound bed um, start to really proliferate and invade the surrounding tissues, as well as just staying in that localised area. So they're moving on at this point. So you might see that the erythema um, starts to extend beyond the wound um, bed and wound edges. And you might notice that actually your patient is, is starting to become um, more aware of their wound infection. Pain would be increasing. Um, you would notice some of the same signs as we did in, in the classic symptoms, um, but it may also be starting to demonstrate early systemic infection as well. So you might have a raised temperature, for example. Then we move on to systemic infection. And this is where the wound bed itself is really affected by those microorganisms. They've, they're starting to spread throughout the body, through the vascular and lymphatic systems. Um, and really, you're at high risk here of sepsis and, and organ dysfunction. And this, this is something that really needs urgent attention and probably hospitalisation. We then look at the arrow sitting at the top of this chart and look at biofilms. Now, biofilms can be present from that um, local infection stage right the way through to the systemic infection. And it's a structured community of microorganisms that create um, a barrier to healing. Biofilms aren't visible to the eye, 
um, and they can be very difficult to identify. We'll go on to that in a little more detail um, in this next section. So what is a biofilm? I've already mentioned that it's this community of, of microorganisms um, that create a barrier to healing. You can see here that there's a picture of teeth and previously this is how, how people identified or tried to identify biofilms with that sort of build up that you can feel sometimes on your teeth, that film but that you can't necessarily see. So that would be a type of, of biofilm. But again, what we need to remember here is that biofilms aren't visible um, with, with our eyes. They might, they will be visible underneath microscope, but we don't have a microscope with us when we're going to assess our patients. So we need to bear that in mind. Around 80% of non-healing wounds contain a biofilm. And some of the really classic signs of having a biofilm present is delayed healing, increased exudatal slough in a wound bed, um, an increased inflammatory response, possibly malodor, and that higher bacterial load. So all of the same common signs and symptoms of a localised wound infection. So biofilms will keep a wound in its inflammatory phase of healing. So it creates that environment. And, and I said, it, as I said, it's a community of, of microorganisms that create um, a shell almost a protective layer to stop us trying to um, get through that layer in order to to remove them and, and move this stage uh, wound healing stage on. So that chronic inflammatory response that we might be seeing in a non healing wound could indicate that presence of biofilm. The signs of infection are also signs of biofilm. I have mentioned a couple of times, they're not visible to the naked eye, but you will be able to identify them through that delayed healing, increased exudate and slough, the increased inflammatory response that you might be seeing, some malodor, erythema, or um, when you're suspecting a, a higher bacterial load. The way that we should manage biofilms and the international best practice for the management of biofilms is to prepare our wound bed. Now, what I mean by that is really to debride and cleanse and remove, break down those microorganisms that are creating this sort of shell and protective layer to the wound bed. By disturbing them and removing the biofilms and, and starting to break them up using uh, maybe a manual debridement tool, um, will help us to prepare that wound bed and remove the barrier to healing. What we then need to be doing is applying a, a barrier dressing to prevent any um, exudate, exudate getting onto peri-wound skin, to try and manage that exudate and prevent any recontamination of, of the biofilm. Biofilms can come back within 24 hours, so it's important that we're managing that wound bed and creating the optimum healing environment removing as much of it as possible in our preparation phase and then selecting the appropriate treatment to put on top of that wound um, to prevent them from reforming. If we are suspecting that there's a biofilm formation um, presence or that they're showing signs of, of wound infection, then we may want to be thinking along the lines of um, infection treatment and, and management. So maybe an antimicrobial dressing to prevent that from coming back and reforming. So we'll now move on and look at wound infection and some of the different bacteria causing infection. So the microorganisms in wounds, there are, there are a whole multitude of microorganisms that we find in wounds, up to potentially 60 different species um, in a wound isn't uncommon. But there are two types that we see quite, quite commonly in our practice, and they're Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus. So Pseudomonas, we can normally tell straight away when we see a patient, it might have that sort of green tint to it almost. Um, but again, 52.2% of chronic leg ulcers contain a Pseudomonas. Um, and those wounds normally are, are characterized by slightly larger wound sizes, slower healing rates, um, and as I said, that, that green discoloration. <clears throat> 
Then we move on to the Staphylococcus. So one of the common um, things that you might be thinking here is MRSA. And it can be very challenging to, to treat um, and get rid of, but it's something that we need to be aware of. And 30% of all individuals, healthy individuals, carry this within their nose without even being aware of it. So it is present and it's, it's quite commonly seen, but we need to try and prevent that from getting into a wound bed or if it's there, then we need to try and find the best treatment for this person. So some of our complications of wound infection can be um, necrotic or devitalised tissue. And we need to be able to remove that and prepare the wound and get rid of the barrier um, that the necrotic and devitalised tissue is causing. But other complications can be things such as osteomyelitis or sepsis. Um, and we need to be aware of that in, in what we're looking at when we're assessing a wound. Sepsis does need urgent treatment and it can be life threatening and life changing for people. So we need to be able to recognise some of the overall signs and symptoms of sepsis. So excessive pain, confusion, disorientation, shortness of breath, shivering, fever, um, high temperature, increased heart rate, um, somebody being quite clammy. If they've got a wound and you're noticing all of these things and you're in any doubt, then you really should be um, almost sus suspect that they have a sepsis and start to treat them for that and get them into an urgent care facility for, for further investigation. It does need rapid intervention if you're suspecting that somebody has sepsis. So diagnosing a wound infection. We've looked at the wound um, infection continuum and the different stages um, of that continuum. But how do we actually diagnose a wound infection? Well, that's where using an appropriate framework can really help us. So our holistic assessment is key. We need to take into account all of the factors surrounding the patient. So their environment, their past medical history, the wound itself, what, what's caused the wound. And this will help us to identify whether there is um, a wound infection present. So Coloplast developed the Triangle of Wound Assessment, which is a fantastic framework which looks at not only the patient as a whole, but it looks at the three areas of the wound, um, the wound bed, the wound edge and the peri wound skin, as well as the social context around the patient. So all, all of the things that we need to be looking at to identify um, what the approach to managing this patient and creating the optimum healing environment would be. It's a very simple framework to use and it helps us with our decision making. So by assessing our wound and our patient as a whole, we can then identify the management goals that are appropriate for this patient. We then move on to select an appropriate treatment. So it's almost a three step approach. So the benefits of using the triangle of wound assessment is that actually it's really intuitive and easy to use. It helps to facilitate our documentation because, as all of us know as clinicians, if we didn't document it, it didn't happen. And we need to be really thorough with our documentation in order to help um, support our colleagues who might also be visiting the patient. But to make it clear as well what treatment this patient needs, what, what you've done with this patient, what you've done for this patient, and really try and get the patient involved in their own care as well, as much as possible. It helps to facilitate the management plan and setting those goals um, in order to, to move this wound on in its stage of healing. So the assessment of an infected wound. Um, we've got a case study here that we're going to be looking at, and it's an infected traumatic wound on a lower leg, which can commonly be seen in practice. So the, the holistic approach um, looks at the patient and the social context first. So we would go through the patient's age, gender, um, what their nutritional status is like, their mobility, whether they smoke or drink alcohol, what's their working and living arrangements, um, do they have any significant comorbidities or medications that they're taking, 
do we need to take into account any previous surgeries that they may have had? Um, the, the wound description, the wound itself, where is the wound? Um, the anatomical location of a wound can really help us to identify the cause of a wound. What size is the wound? How painful is it for the patient? All things that we should be looking at in that first instance. So in this case, we're looking at a, a patient who's 79 years old, um, who has osteoporosis and rheumatoid arthritis, and they're receiving cortisone therapy, so steroid injections. They're severely handicapped by the arthritis and osteoporosis, and they live a, in a home environment with um, self-care. So on day one, you can see the image here, and actually it shows some sloughy tissue, um, medium levels of exudate, and there's a slight excoriation there to the um, wound edge. So what we then need to do is identify and set some management goals for the wound bed, wound edge and peri-wound skin. So you can see here with the X's marked um, on the slide that we want to remove the non-viable tissue from the wound bed, manage the exudate, manage the bacterial bioburden that's present um, and protect any new and, and forming granular or epithelial tissue. The management of the exudate really is key for the peri-wound skin and to reduce any excoriation. And we also, as I've mentioned, want to try and protect that granular tissue that is present. So we need to find something that's appropriate for all of those um, things that we've identified. So the appropriate treatment for this patient and choosing an appropriate treatment really is key. This image is, is day two and a sharp debridement was performed. An antimicrobial silicon foam dressing was applied to try and manage the infection and that bacterial load. The patient also received oral antibiotics for eight days um, and the dressing here you can see conformed well to the wound bed, meaning that there wasn't room for a gap to form and for exudate to then start to leak. The exudate was well controlled and you can see here it was absorbed vertically. So after 12 days of treatment, um, the signs of local infection had disappeared and there was no longer need for an antimicrobial silicon foam dressing. So it was stepped down at this point to a, a normal foam dressing to promote that moist healing environment and to manage the wound exudate. So after day 40 of, with this treatment plan, um, the, the wound had reduced significantly, as you can see, from nine millimetres to two millimetres. There was some granular tissue filling the wound bed and the wound itself was looking much healthier. You haven't got that excoriation to the uh, wound edge and surrounding skin. Um, and then you can see here on day 131, the wound is completely healed. Now, this person has had some compression therapy as well to support the healing. So when do we need to be taking into account other ways of identifying wound infection? So my, microbial sampling, so um, swabs of wounds. We might want to look at acute wounds with classic symptoms of infection or chronic wounds with signs of that spreading or systemic infection. Infected wounds that have failed to respond to the antimicrobial treatment that we're using or they're getting worse um, despite using that treatment. Compliance with our local protocols and procedures is key. So you should be looking at your own trusts um, policy and procedure on wound swabbing and familiarise yourself with that. So where there's um, suspected certain bacteria that you might um, want to, to swab or if you're being advised to do so by a specialist um, would be another reason for doing it. So if we've identified that we have a wound on that continuum that is likely to need treatment, how do we manage that infected wound? It's really important that we get the management of this right. And to be able to do that, we've already identified that our wound assessment is key and can really help us with identifying some of the barriers to healing 
um, which in turn helps us to identify what we need to do to support the wound um, to get it to an optimum healing environment. So management of wound infection. It's really important to use our holistic framework that will allow the, an assessment of the whole patient, not necessarily just the wound. So the management of, of the wound infection, we need that optimal host response. We need to create that optimal host response. Now that can be managing um, comorbidities such as diabetes and making sure that somebody um, is sitting within a, an appropriate range for them um, with their diabetes management or optimise their nutritional status and hydration. Are they eating and drinking the right things and enough of the right things to, to give them the best possible um, outcome and, and optimal host response? Do we need to be looking at any other treatments or any other sites of infection in conjunction with the wound? Um, are we providing antimicrobial therapy if it's required? And at what stage are we providing that antimicrobial therapy? Are we managing the patient's pain and any temperature that they might have? Ensure that the person is cooperating with the care that we're trying to provide. Make sure that they're educated around what's happening and being able to discuss this with them and really get them on board um, will all help to create that optimum host response. So when we're looking at the general environmental measures and the things that we need to do, we need to provide our wound care in a clean environment. That's difficult or challenging at times if we're in the community, but we need to find ways to overcome that. And if we're in a patient's home and it's not the cleanest of environments, we need to be making sure that we're following our own aseptic technique as much as possible, making sure that we've got a sterile field, that we're using the appropriate um, PPE, for example. Provide the patient with, with education or the carer if a carer is involved with, with this person's care. Making sure that we understand our own policies and procedures and that we're storing equipment appropriately um, and that we're not using dressings that have been left open, for example, um, because they're not going to be sterile at that point. So we want to try and reduce the microbial load within the wound bed to prevent the further contamination um, or cross contamination from either us whilst dressing the wound or the contamination from a, an inappropriate dressing. We want to manage the exudate um, and ensure that the dressing selected is appropriate for the level of exudate that we're seeing within the wound. The dressing may or may not need to, to contain an antimicrobial agent and then we need to make sure that we're selecting the right antimicrobial agent um, for the type of wound that we're seeing. Ensure that we've protected the peri-wound skin so that we're not going to, to see further breakdown of this wound. Optimise the wound bed, so debride the wound, get rid of any of those devitalised tissues, the slough or necrosis that's sitting there. Make sure that we're cleansing the wound bed and selecting the appropriate dressing to, to create that optimum healing environment. So when should we be implementing an antimicrobial? Now, antimicrobials can be overused and actually we don't necessarily require an antimicrobial if a wound is sitting in the stages of contamination or colonisation. We just need to be vigilant. We need to keep an eye on the wound and make sure that there's, it's not showing any um, deterioration or signs of local infection. It's at that point of local infection when we're identifying through our assessment that there is a local infection or potential biofilm presence that we need to start looking at a topical antimicrobial. When we move on to spreading infection and systemic infection, this is where we would not only be looking at a topical antimicrobial, we would also be looking at the potential for oral antibiotics or even intravenous antibiotics, depending on the stage of infection. So, we really need to bear this in mind and, and try and identify at the earliest possible stage when somebody does have 
that local infection. And it's at that point that we need to um, ensure that somebody has the correct treatment and the use of an antimicrobial. So topical antimicrobial treatment options. We have either antibiotics, as I mentioned, or antiseptics. And the antiseptics can include things like iodine, PHMB, silver, um, and the antibiotics quite commonly used in wound infection would be metronidazole gel, maybe flucloxacillin, um, and there are, there are a whole range that we, we could potentially be using. For the antiseptics, the idea is that they'll disrupt, disrupt um, the bacterial load or um, fungus or virus that's, that's present um, and start to reduce that bacterial load, start to, to treat that bacteria and, and get rid of it. The antibiotics, um, whether that's topical or oral antibiotics, um, are not recommended for general wound management infection. But actually, they, they do have um, a need at times if we're suspecting that this infection is spreading or systemic. So we need to know what we what we need to treat the wound with. Um, and hopefully we've managed to identify on what stage of the wound infection continuum the wound is sitting to enable us to, to develop a treatment plan um, that's appropriate for our patient. So if we're looking at topical antimicrobials, there's a whole array of things that we can use. Honey, PHMB, iodine, silvers, they're all commonly used in wound care. And we'll go into each of these in a little more detail. So honey, it's been around for, for a number of years, but was first developed into a wound dressing in the 1990s. And the mode of action in honey um, is believed to have um, the antimicrobial activity comes from the ability to reduce the, the pH balance and to remove any excess fluid and supply the uh, topical nutrients to try and enhance that tissue growth. So honey is, is or can be great for wound healing, but it can also make wounds appear slightly wetter. So we just need to be making sure that we're selecting an appropriate antimicrobial for the type of wound that we're trying to treat. We then have PHMB. Again, it's been around for a number of years and is more commonly seen or was more commonly seen in the um, irrigation solutions that we sometimes use in wound healing. It helps to infiltrate the cell membrane and kill bacteria by disrupting that cell membrane. And it does interact with the cell's DNA, the bacterial DNA within the cell. So again, starting to kill this off. There is evidence supporting the effect of um, PHMB, but this varies. So again, just something to be aware of and um, to really make sure that we're selecting an appropriate antimicrobial for the wound that we're seeing. We then move on to iodine. And again, iodine has several modes of action. They're not all fully understood, but it does result in the bacterial cell bursting and dying off. So what's important is that actually not all preparations of iodine that we see in dressings are long lasting. And we need to be mindful of this when we're selecting a dressing. Is it going to deliver um, the iodine to the wound bed for as long as we require it to? because we already know that things like biofilms, for example, can reform within 24 hours. So we need to make sure that we're selecting a dressing that's appropriate for the time frame that we want to um, leave that dressing in place for. Then we move on to silvers. And silvers have been used for, for thousands of years in wound care to prevent and treat infection. Um, and it comes in different forms. So it can come in a, in a solid form, um, it can come as a cleansing solution or um, an ointment compound. But more recently, we've seen it in a range of um, dressings. And silver provides a sustained release um, in some of these dressings, but that can mean less frequent need for change. But again, we still need to make sure that our exudate is being managed appropriately.
So silver targets multiple sites of bacteria and it works in three different ways. So the silver ions bind and um, block any transport of substances in and out of the cell. It also transports the bacterial cell um, it's, and stops the respiratory system from working. So it destroys that energy production. And then in the third way, it stops that replication because it's destroyed the energy. It means that the cell can't replicate. So with those three modes of action, it actually means that topical antimicrobials in, in silvers and silver wound dressings can be a really effective way of managing and treating um, different bacteria within a wound. Any of these antimicrobials should be used as a two week challenge. Now, you've probably heard of the two week challenge. And really what we mean by that is to apply an antimicrobial for two weeks, um, changing it regularly throughout that two week time frame based on our assessment um, and reassess after a two week period of use. The reason we're reassessing is to see whether the treatment has worked and cleared the signs of infection or to see if actually it's improved things, but it's not completely um, cleared in which case we may want to continue the treatment for a further two weeks. If there's no improvement at all at this point, then we might be having to look at what else is happening with this patient. Is there something that we've missed? Do we need to discontinue the use of this and try something else? We may also at this point want to, to um, swab our wound or, or undergo further investigation to see if there is um, more to this or more happening within this wound that, that we haven't identified in our initial assessment. So reassessment really is key at that point. So I'm hoping that today's session has been useful for you and wound infection doesn't have to always be complex. We can identify wound infection early if we're looking at the wound infection uh, continuum and managing to identify um, through our holistic assessment um, what we're seeing. So hopefully you'll have taken something from today's session and have found it useful in your day to day practice. And if you have any questions or would like to follow up at all with a member of the Coloplast team, please feel free to contact your local territory representative. Thank you.